This morning, uh, we're talking about how to grow spiritually. How to grow spiritually. And we're going to look at spiritual growth in light of growing physically. Because you can think of like how to grow physically and what would be the spiritual counterpart of how you would grow physically. Well, we want to grow spiritually, don't we? How to grow spiritually. So the question I want you all to reflect on this morning is are you growing spiritually? Are you growing spiritually? Right? And we're going to talk about the different factors. Are you growing spiritually? Are you older in the faith than you were last year? Are you older in the faith than you were six months ago? Right? Or are you starting to go back? So we're going to look at some factors here this morning. Are you growing spiritually? Now we read through uh, 2 Peter 1, because the question I want to talk about first is what does growing in the spiritual life actually look like? And you may have a misconception of what it looks like, but here in 2 Peter 1, we give some steps of things that add to the faith. And I've always found this very interesting. The order in which we add things to our faith shows this spiritual growth that happens in our life. 2 Peter 1 verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence... See, see, if you want to grow, you need to give all diligence. You've got to put some effort in. You've got to be diligent about growing. Why? Because it's not automatic. It's not automatic. You have to be diligent. What does it mean to be diligent? It's like you're aware. You've got attention to detail. You're putting in effort. You're making sure things are getting done. There's some proactiveness. Giving all diligence. Add to your faith, right? Because the first part of the chapter is talking about our salvation. So we have the faith already. What do we want to add to our faith? Virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So as I go through these things, I want you to note the order of things. You may not know what all these things mean. You may have an assumption of what they mean. So let's just, uh, I just mentioned to you, them to you briefly so you know what it's talking about. So it says here, add to your faith virtue. So you think about a virtuous person. It's somebody that's doing things that are right, right? Getting the sin out of their life, doing what's right, right? A virtuous person, right? And to virtue, knowledge. So you start adding to your faith, doing some things that are right, doing some things that are virtuous, and then you add to your virtue, knowledge. Did you catch that? Did you catch that you don't learn first, then add virtue? Isn't that interesting? Because often what happens in the Christian life is you get saved, you don't really know anything. Does that mean you don't start doing what's right? No, you ought to look to the examples of people doing things right, me and many others in the church, and you start following and do what they're doing. Right? So you add to your faith virtue. You may not know why it should be done, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Right? So, you know, people know, hey, you go to church, you're reading your Bible, you're praying, hey, how do they dress? How do they talk? How do they behave themselves? What do they do for God? Well, they, oh, they're preaching God. Hey, maybe I should preach the gospel. Maybe I should get involved. You know, doing these things, add virtue. Then to virtue, knowledge. Once you start following along and you start doing some virtuous things, then you learn, oh, that's that's why we do it. That's why it's a good thing to do. Now I understand why we do it. So you virtue, to virtue knowledge. And to knowledge temperance. What does temperance mean? We don't really use that word today. When you think about it, you temper something. Temper, you know, it's disciplined. You see, you think of your temper. People get their temper under. We think about temper. Somebody losing their temper. What happens when you lose your temper? Right? You lose control. Right? So temperance in the Bible is like being disciplined. So now that you have some good things you're doing, now you know why you're doing it, now it's about consistency, keeping on doing it, right? That's temperance. And to temperance, patience. Now patience, you just think, hey, I'm just waiting around, being patient for something to happen. No, patience in the Bible is when you are patient through hard times, right? Patient through tribulation. So oftentimes when you start doing some good things, you're learning, now you're starting to be consistent. Now you're dedicated, you're disciplined. What comes next? Sometimes what comes into your life is a bit of persecution, you know, a, bit of, a bit of ridicule, a bit of hard times. Maybe you're thinking, oh, you know, things are going well, happy, joyful. Then something comes into your life 
you get some trials and temptations and whatnot. Hey, you've got to be patient. You've got to endure through those. And to patience, godliness. So as you say virtue, you think virtue may be, hey, you're starting to do some good things. Now that you've got going through some patience, some trials and tribulations, now godliness. What's godliness? This is where you start trying to cut the sin out of your life. Vain things out of your life. You know, you've got bad habits. You've got to get rid of those. Right? Godliness, sins. You know, maybe there's different sins. Drugs, fornication, drunkenness, you know, greediness, covetousness. What else? Self-centeredness. All that laziness. Oh, Victor. Ah, me. Laziness. Some godliness in your life, right? But notice, but notice how far along it is. Because you know people will say things like, well, I can't serve God until I get the sin out of my life. It's just the other way around. You start doing good. You start, being dis you start doing stuff. And you know what? Then, you start, then it, the, the sin starts getting cut out of your life. You know what I mean? So godliness comes a lot later. It's a lot harder. So imagine trying to do that when you're a babe. Right? When you're growing through these stages. To godliness, so you're getting the sin out of your life, to godliness, brotherly kindness. What's brotherly kindness? When you start loving your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But notice you have brotherly kindness, and then ultimately, what's the goal of Christianity? It's charity. I guess you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the ultimate goal, it's charity. Because brotherly kindness... It's like loving people that love you. Loving people that are nice to you. But charity is where we want to strive for. And that's loving people because we love God, whether or not the person loves us or not. Right? That's charity. For if these things be in you, and abound. Right? So notice, you want to grow in these things, right? In order to have a successful Christian life, for if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that you should neither be barren, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So when you're striving to do this, you're going to bring forth fruit to God. And there's different types of fruit. Obviously, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of our lips. But also, we're going to help others to get saved. You know, the more you do these things, the more you're going to realize. I mean, uh, that's one of the definitions of charity. I mean, charity, we go out, we, the people that we talk to, I don't even appreciate we're there. Right? It's charity. Hopefully the people that get saved or they get saved later, one day they will appreciate the seed that we've sown in their heart. But he that lacketh these things, look at this. So this is the other side of the coin. He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And often that's the case. Why do we have such a lack of love and lack of a desire to grow in our spiritual life? Because we often don't reflect on what God has done for us. And that's why how many times did God say to the Israelites, you know, when he's always talking to them, hey, I am the Lord your God, what? That brought you up out of the land of Egypt. How many times does he say that? Because he's reminding them of the great deliverance and salvation that he gave to them. And there they are complaining about God and murmuring, you know, not thinking about the things of God. Why? Because they're blind and they haven't seen it. They've forgotten of the salvation, the great things that God has done for them. And sometimes we forget about the great things God has done for us when we go about our lives and have no desire to grow spiritually in the work of God. Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence, so again that word, diligence, to make your calling and election sure. So this is not saying here that you've got to do these things to know that you're saved. What is it saying here? When something is sure, it means it doesn't move. When you make something sure, sure and steadfast. So it's not that you'll lose your salvation and all this. It's just that you have your faith in terms of the faith to be saved, right? Believing on receiving the grace through faith. But remember, we don't only get saved by faith, right? Grace through faith. We do works by faith. So we have, we have to be in the faith in the sense that we've got to be doing what God tells us to do too. Not to be saved, but we want to make that sure. We don't want to fall away from the faith. Right? We don't want to get out of church. We don't want to be the stony ground here, or the thorny ground here, where they just spring up and then they die. Or they get out. Yeah, the seed went into that. They're saved, but they don't bring forth any fruit. Remember, I said here in the previous passage, they make you that you should neither be barren 
nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not that you're not saved, but you're not going to bring forth any fruit for God. So if you want some fruit, that's how you have the Christian, uh, successful Christian life. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, stable, solid. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Never fall. That's a pretty good promise, right, from the Bible? That if you are diligent about growing in the Christian faith, striving for charity, then that's going to make your calling and election sure. Matthew 22. We see here that charity is the ultimate goal of the Christian life. Then one of them asked him, this is the, the lawyer is talking to Jesus, which was, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the Lord? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, I want you to notice verse 40, because everyone knows first and second commandment. But what I want you to notice here is, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You know, people say, oh, I love God so much, I love everyone so much. But do you care about keeping the commandments of God? Do you care about what the law and the prophets have to say? Then the question is, do you really love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Because what Jesus is saying here is, how do you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? How do you love your neighbor and yourself? Hey, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's how you're going to fulfill these commandments, right? By keeping God, well, these two greatest commandments, by keeping God's commandments, right? So love is the ultimate goal. Charity, as the Bible mentions the word love, because love can also mean a desire. So the Bible talking about charity, because charity is actually the act of loving somebody else, doing something for somebody else, as opposed to also possibly being the feeling, right? When we use the word love, you can use love in the way that charity is used, but you can use the word love, like saying, I really love ice cream, you know, I really love chocolate, I really love, like you have a strong desire to something as opposed to doing something for somebody. So let's have a look at 1 Corinthians 13, and then we'll see what the Bible has to say about charity. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I've become as sounding brass or a tinkling symbol, right? So if somebody's eloquent, can say all sorts of things, but if they don't have charity, what does it say? It becomes a sounding brass, or a tinkling symbol. Just the, the analogies that are used here. And, um, you know, just on another topic, but Paul is not saying here that he's able to speak in the tongues of angels, because you'll see later on that he's just saying, even if I did these things. He didn't do all these things that he's talking about. Though I have the gift of prophecy, this he did have, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have charity. Look at this. I am nothing. So you see how charity is like a multiplier in the Christian life? And if you don't have charity, that multiplier is zero. Can you believe that? That's what the Bible says. Hey, he says, I have not charity. If I do all these things and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. So you see here that obviously he didn't bestow everything he had to feed the poor. He's saying, hey, even if I gave it all away. So this is why he's saying, even if I did these things. He's not saying he did do necessarily all these things. And though I give my body to be burned, didn't do that, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffers long, suffereth long. Right? So when I mean, you love somebody, you suffer, right? You put up with wrongdoing to you. And is kind. It's nice to people. Charity envieth not. Right? When somebody gets something or obtains something, loving them means that you're happy for them. You're happy that they get it. It's not, oh, it must be nice having that. You know, it must be nice. Oh, I wish you know, I had something like that. That's not charity. Charity vaunteth not itself, right? It's not puffed up. This is talking about talking itself up as opposed to what's charity? Talking up somebody else. You, know, you don't want your own mouth to praise you, you want another mouth, another mouth to praise you. Or, or your mouth can praise somebody else. Doth not behave itself unseemly, right? So it thinks about how it behaves and its behaviour affecting other people. Why seeketh not her own, right? Not after its own interests, but the interests of others. It's not easily provoked, that's charity. Are you somebody that's easily offended? Are you somebody that easily gets angry? 
Are you somebody that's easily worked up? Yeah, that's not charity. Charity is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil, right? You don't want bad things to happen to other people. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. What does that mean? You're not happy that somebody's in sin, right? Sometimes you see people doing you know, things. Sometimes I see people that are out, they're like, you know, drinking, getting drunk, and then people like that on Facebook. God, are you rejoicing in iniquity? You're rejoicing in people getting, getting, you know, getting smashed and getting all drunk? But rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, right? So you help other people, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So you see how there is some work, there's some endurance there where it's going through hard times together. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. So what is this talking about? This is talking about you know, if there are prophecies that have not yet, you know, been fulfilled, you know, they're, they're, they one day will come to pass and then there will no longer be a prophecy that's outstanding, right? Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. So there'll be, there's the gift of tongues and things where people are given supernatural powers in order to preach the gospel. One day they're going to go away. They shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But then what, that which is perfect is come then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So you can see there the analogy of charity being an adult, right? And then ungodliness and everything like that, that's starting to come out of your life. It's the childish things, right? But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, what is that talking about? It's like you're seeing through like a window, right? You're looking through glass, but it's like foggy. You can't really see through. It's seeing through a glass darkly. So right now when we read through the Bible, what is, why is it saying we see through a glass darkly? It means we hear about these things, we read about them, but we don't really know what it looks like. That's not 100% clear. But then one day we're going to see Jesus face to face. Right now, right now we see him through his word. Right, He is his word. But one day we're going to see him face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. Right? So faith is believing, hope is looking forward to things, charity is loving other people. These three, but look at this, the greatest of these is charity. Right? So we have a whole chapter on the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. This is one you should know. It's the, it's the charity chapter. In the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, talks about charity. Often people read it at weddings and they read it at other things where they talk about love and what love is. And you see, love is a doing things. So it's not love, it's not just necessarily about feeling. Right? Love is doing things for other people, believing, hoping, enduring, doing for others, thinking about others, not your own. But it says here at the end, these three, faith, hope, charity, but the greatest of these is charity. And of course, the assumption here is charity defined by the Bible. And I just have to mention that because, you know, you've got the you know, love is love, you know, from the homosexual crowd, but then you also just have the new age, the new ages that are all like, oh, it's all about love, man, just love everybody, love everything, you know. And, you know, love is a popular word. But we need to make sure when we think about love, we think about charity, it's charity according to the Bible. Love according to the Bible. Unrighteousness, false religion, false gods, sin, you know, that is not love according to the Bible, right? We need to love according to God's word. So obviously, every time the Bible talks about love and charity, you need to be careful not to have your own mindset, your own ideas about what love is, right? We need to go to the word and we need God to teach us what love is. And um, that's a whole other sermon in and of itself. All right. So I know that was a super long introduction, but that's uh, talking about what it looks like to grow in the Christian faith. So notice, Second Peter 1, you're growing, knowledge, you know, virtue, knowledge, patience, you know, temperance, patience, um, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, charity. Right? So that's what it looks like. Now, what are the elements in your physical life that allow you to grow? And we're going to look at the spiritual equivalent. Right? So one obvious thing that you need in order to grow in your physical life is food. It's food. You need to make sure you're eating. 
You know, sometimes I tell my kids, you know, you don't eat, you're not going to grow being a strong. I remember like there were many times I didn't get food when I was young, you know, my, both parents working, not always taking care of us. My kids are lucky, a mum at home, stuff in their face, there's more food than they can eat. You know, and more food, like, you know, that's when you're turning away food. I remember when I was getting, we never turned away food, or whenever we kept food, it's like, we're going over to other people's houses, like, can I, can I eat something? <laughs> so sometimes I feel for, you know, people that come to our house and ask for food. So food, food is going to make you grow. So what's the spiritual food? Luke 4, the devil said unto him, this is Jesus' temptation, if thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. So remember, Jesus tempted 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness. He's fasting. And here the temptation is to eat something. Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So what is the spiritual food in our spiritual life? It's learning, reading, studying, you know, meditating on the word of God. So today here, you're getting a bit of a meal as we look at God's word. Job 23, look at this. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I, have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You see here, Job values the word of God even more than the physical food. And that's what Jesus was showing us, you know, when he was tempted with food. No, he valued God's word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. First Peter 2. Talks about some growth here as babes, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So see, as you, you know, it's, it's likening here that we ought to, as Christians, have that desire, that, you know, that sort of uncontrollable desire that a baby has for his mother's milk. God wants us to have that desire like a newborn baby. He doesn't want us to be babes. But he wants us to have that desire for the word like a baby, right? They cry out. I mean, I mean, for those of you who have babies, you know, when they want to eat, they think about how they react. It's not this is the world. And as soon as they you know, get picked up, they just immediately pass away. You know, they go from like 100 to zero, right? Well, that's how God wants us. He wants us to be like yearning, cry like Job. I've, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And he wants us to be as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Right, so some questions for you guys to think about, some challenges. Are you reading your Bible? Are you reading your Bible? Is today the first time you looked at a Bible verse this week? Shame on you. you know? If you haven't been at church for the last couple of weeks, is this the first time you've looked at a Bible verse in the last couple of weeks? Shame on you. Yeah, and you wonder, am I growing as a Christian? Well, if you're not eating, how are you going to be growing? If you're not eating the spiritual food. When was the last time you read your Bible? When you read your Bible the last time, how much did you read? Do you get like those email devotions that's like one verse and you're like, tick, Bible read, done, you know? So how much Bible did you read? So if you ask yourself the question, are you growing spiritually? Well, how are you going to grow without some food? Do you study the Bible? You know, so if church is the only Bible you get in your spiritual diet, of course you won't be growing. You know, going to church is like going out to eat. Right? You know, you know some churches are like that dodgy place around the corner. Maybe they got a nice sign out the front and you go there. I remember going to a Chinese place in the area. I'm not going to mention the name. <laughs> then you go there and it's like they serve you. It's like I got Chinese tea and then I got like an English teacup. I'm like, what's, what's going on? Like, it's, like, it's not Chinese. They eat like Chinese teacup. But, you know, you guys all know the place I'm talking about. Yeah, you know, some churches are like that. They look good on the outside, but then you get in, it's, uh, it's a little bit dodgy. Some churches, though, are like a dessert shop. What I mean by that? Go to church. You know, what, what is the, what is the, if you think about the desserts in the Christian life, it's the things that are sweet, the things that make you feel good. Right? So some churches are like a dessert shop. Where you go there, and it's, they're always like uplifting and love and things like that. And hey, dessert has its place in the Christian diet, doesn't it? 
But you want to just eat dessert after dessert after dessert after dessert. You know what? You know, maybe if you're the type of person that goes to church once a year, a couple of times a year, you go to the dessert shop church, and it's like, hey man, this is really good. I haven't had that banana split in a long time. But you know what? If you're going to, if you're actually going to church regularly and eating at church, you know the Bible, you're going to start getting sick of the feel-good sermon. Right, you want to get some meat, you want to learn some things. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 27. The full soul loatheth an honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. So it's so interesting, I don't even know this proverb in the Bible. It talks about, hey, keep eating sweet things and you're full, you actually loathe it. That's what happens also with spiritual teaching as well. Feel good sermons, you know, they have their place. Right, I like the odd feel good sermon every now and then. Uh, but you can only grow so much, guys. By eating desserts. Am I right? So that's why, you know, say you're listening to other sermons, you've got my sermon, you've got other sermons, you, you know, you're listening to sermons and you like those uplifting ones, you know, you're the type to put old Mr. Joel, Joel Osteen on there, you know, like, because he's so uplifting and everything, but if that's all you're listening to, you're not going to grow only eating sweets and desserts, right? So you need to get some meat into you, and we'll look at that verse later. When the Bible's likened to like milk, strong meat. Right? Now, if food makes you grow physically, how many of you eat once a week? Nobody. You eat every day, multiple times a day. Maybe more than like, you know, three times a day. You know? Like nowadays, you know, in our prosperous nation, you got breakfast and then you got morning tea and then you got lunch and then you got afternoon tea and then you got dinner and then you got snack before you go to bed. And then, you know, maybe you're watching something, you're having stuff, you know, he's eating all the time, you know, you're growing. Well, think about your spiritual life. How are you going to grow if you only eat once a week? And if you're not even coming to church once a week, how are you growing? Of course you're not growing, right? Because you're not getting enough food in you. So what you need to get to, what you need to strive to, guys, you need to get to the point where you can feed yourself. And you know, yeah, sure, at the beginning, it's going to be, you know, you read the Bible, it's going to be difficult to understand. It's going to be hard to feed yourself, right? Like a baby, you know, for those of you who have kids growing up, you know, they're learning to use a spoon. Choke themselves, they hurt themselves. You know, that's what it's like with kids. It's the same in the spiritual life. Sometimes it's a, bit diff it's a bit difficult, but do you want to keep being that baby? Being spoon fed? No, you want to grow in your Christian life? You learn to feed yourself, right? So whether you can feed yourself in the Christian life or whether you need somebody to spoon feed you all the time, that's a measure of your spiritual growth. You say, you know, I'm not reading, I don't feed myself, I need somebody to explain things to me all the time. Well, that just shows you. It's okay to be a baby. It's okay to start. It's okay to grow. But you don't want to stay there, right? You want to be growing in your Christian life. So not only that, not only is spiritual, you know, doctrine, the spirit, which is the word of God, that's your spiritual food, you want to get rid of the bad foods in your life. All right, so we talked about desserts. So desserts aren't necessarily bad for you. Too much of it can be bad for you. What is, what is the bad food in the spiritual life? It's the bad philosophies out there, the bad doctrines, all right? Like the doctrines that are like, hey, life is just about you, serving you, loving you. Hey, you know, make sure you take care of number one first, right? No, no, make sure you take care of God first. This is the bad food that's coming into your spiritual life. So you need to, just like you need to get the bad food out of your physical life, you need to get the junk food and the bad food out of your spiritual life. So sometimes it's the self-loving, self-glorifying philosophies that are out there in the world. And if you look for them, you know, the success coaching that's out there, you'll find it. Where it's all about you. It's all about your success. You make things happen. No, that's not who's at the top in reality. Who's at the top? It's God, isn't it? So you've got like the junk food, the stuff that's bad for you, and then you've got the stuff that's really damaging to you. Right? So if you think about what, what are the drugs in the spiritual life where people get on them and it can just you know, cause their spiritual life to crash, it can be the false doctrine that's out there. Sometimes you learn something false. You, know, you get caught up into you know, some works-based salvation ministry and you're listening to all that and then, you're, and then your faith gets made shipwrecked because you're thinking like, oh, I'm not saved, I'm not good enough. 
You know, some of these things, some of these bad doctrines can really, really affect your spiritual life. You need to be careful. You know, be careful of your diet. Be careful of your physical diet. Be careful of your spiritual diet. Look at 2 Corinthians 7. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, to the word of God, let us cleanse ourselves. Look at this. From all filthiness of the flesh, and watch this, and spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You think, I thought filthiness was only like fleshly, physical filthiness. No, because there's spiritual filthiness too, right? And what is spirit? Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So what we are be aware of when it comes to the filth of the spirit, it's the bad doctrine, right? It's the bad influence that is in the world. So we not only cleanse ourselves physically, drugs, fornication, uncleanness as well, it is a bad thing. Right? Just, just general hygiene, right? And the Spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. All right, so that's food. Before I go on to the next one, just some practical tips when it comes to reading the Bible. First of all, you need to get yourself a King James Bible. You know, if some of you may know, not know uh, the stance we take in this church, but when you start looking at all the different translations out there, there are problems. They are not all the same. You know, we don't just use the King James Bible just because, oh, you know, Victor's just carrying on a tradition and you know, he's an old fuddy-duddy, you know, just carrying it on. No, no. We use the King James Bible for a reason. One, it's, it's accurate. And two, it doesn't have verses missing. It uses the right text that it's translating from. And the way even that it's written, right? There's reasons why. Like you see, I, sometimes I, when I hit on verses where it makes a difference that the these and the thous are in there. Right, so they did this for a reason, not only just to make it sound beautiful and make it sound like Shakespeare wrote it. Right, the, the reason why it's there is because English today does not maintain those things that are in the original languages. So the these, thou's, the thines, they're there for a reason. Okay, so there's a reason why we use the King James Bible, and there are problems with the other Bibles. So, you know, when you're reading your Bible, you want to, you know, make sure you're eating. You're going to drink a glass of water. Do you want to drink a glass of water that's got poison in there? No, you'd rather drink a pure glass of water, and that's why we use the King James Bible. So if you don't have one, get one. If you don't, if you don't have one, we've got King James Bibles in the storeroom. So if you don't have one, just let me know. I'll give you one, free. All right? So you read a little bit each day. Easier than reading long chunks every now and then. You, know, you don't always have time to read. You can get an audio Bible. If you look up Alexander Scorby. Alexander Scorby did a really phenomenal Bible reading. So if you buy his Bible, audio Bible, it's like 30-something dollars. You got it on an MP3, you can listen to it. Oftentimes, I don't know about you guys, that helps me. If I've heard somebody say the verse, and I get used to how it sounds, when I read it, it's, it's easier to understand for me. I don't know about you guys. Some people, they just read it, they understand. For me, like if I've heard that passage, sometimes, you know, when I've preached on a passage or I've read through a passage, and you're like, oh, you know, that's how Victor reads that. Sometimes it helps you when you go back and read it, because now you know you know, maybe where the intonations are and all that sort of stuff. It, it changes how you learn from your Bible. So not only that, you learn, hey, you know, talk about the things you learn so you retain them. You know, if you learn something, ask somebody about it. Say, hey, you know, I was reading this in the Bible, this was interesting. Talk about it. Talk about it with your spouse. Talk about it with your friends. Now, when you're reading the Bible, I, I would recommend that you just read it from front to back, right? Some people, they read their Bible and they just open their Bible just to a random place and just randomly read here and there. I wouldn't recommend that because what often happens is, you know, it's a bit like children, right? If you went to a smorgasbord with a child and you said, you know, choose whatever you want to eat, they probably just go straight to the dessert section. And it's like that in the Christian life too. If you just like choose randomly where to read, often you're going to read things you're already very familiar with or the things that you like, but you won't read all of it. Right, so what you want to do is you just want to read all of it. So if you don't, your best Bible plan is to read as much as you can from beginning to end. Now, if you're a new believer, it's probably best to start in the New Testament. The New Testament is a bit easier to read; it's more relevant for the New Testament church, and you know that's where you learn about Jesus and everything. The Old Testament obviously is a lot more difficult. So, but you want to read through all of it. Don't worry if you don't understand it all. You know, it's like with children. Like I really don't like children being picky with what they eat. And parents, you the same. Don't let your children be picky. Just because a child turns their nose up at something, that doesn't mean they shouldn't eat it. You've got to force them. You force them to eat it. Right? Hey, you say, Victor, how do you get your kids to eat all this weird and wonderful things? I force them. I put it in their mouth. Eat it. Otherwise, you're going to get a smack. You know, there are times like that, right? So you force them. They eat it. And before you know it, oh, man, they like eating it. Now they ask for it. It's like, I don't know. So it's an acquired taste. It's the same with the Bible. 
first eat it, you may not like it. It's just weird, I don't get it. It's all the genealogies, I don't get these stories. Who is this person? What's well, going to be like that? Just expect it. But read through it, just keep reading through it. It's going to be like that, right? Uh, so you don't pick and choose. So new believers, I think, hey, start in the New Testament, just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, read to the end. Maybe read through the Old Testament, try, if you struggle, read through the New Testament again. But like I said, just don't worry so much if you read it and you don't understand it. Just keep going. Right? If you don't understand it, just keep going because eventually you will. The great thing about Christianity is, is the textbook doesn't change. Same textbook. Oh, it's going to be the same book. <laughs> same book, no matter what happens. So don't worry if you don't understand everything you read. You will eventually. All right, let's try and get through these other ones a little bit quicker. So growing in the physical life. Now, second one is work. Now imagine in the physical world. Imagine a person, all they did was eat. There are people that exist like that in the real, in the real world. You know, you think about like, you know, your gamers and whatnot. You see about them on the news, like 150 kilos, 200 kilos heavy, where all they did was eat and they didn't do any work. So we don't just want to grow, right? Because if you were to put on some spiritual glasses and look at people spiritually, they, they may look all oh, prim and proper, but if you were to look at them spiritually, they'd be like that person that is just eating and not doing any work, right? They're like obese Christians, have a lot of knowledge, but don't do any work. And remember, when we looked at the totem pole of spiritual growth in Christian life, where's knowledge? It's actually quite low down, right? So just knowing a lot about the Christian life doesn't make you very old in the Christian life, in the Christian timescale, right? Because what was it? Add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. Many steps away from charity, which is the goal that we are going towards. So we don't want to be spiritually obese. And what is the work of the Christian life? Well, let's go to the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So you see here it's about teaching and preaching the Word of God both to unbelievers and to believers and then teaching them also to keep the commandments of God which includes preaching the Gospel to unbelievers and teaching the Word to believers. Right? So that's the work we're in when it comes to the spiritual fight that we're in. It's about preaching the Word, getting the Gospel out there. So how can we do this practically? Practically. Well, when it comes, obviously, you've got soul winning, right? Preaching the gospel, that's why we go out and we preach the gospel, you know? We preach the gospel to people we don't know. We preach the gospel to people we know as well, right? So people that you come across, people that you work with, people that you talk to, and about, yeah, you preach the gospel to them, but also we need to preach the gospel to people we don't know. And that's why as a church, we have a ministry where we're actually reaching people we don't know. Hey, if you're not reaching people you don't know, you've got to get involved in that ministry. Come, be a silent partner. Learn. See, and you know what? When you go out and you learn and you hear how people preach the gospel, then you're going to learn. You're going to be more prepared when you talk to the people you do know. So there's like a double benefit. Not only are we reaching people with the gospel, but you also are learning and reminding yourself of the truths of God's word. So you're ready to preach the gospel when the time comes. Because how many times, sometimes you get an opportunity, but you're not ready. People ask you a question, you're not ready. Right? Because it requires some training, it requires some practice beforehand. Right? But if you just like never ever do it and then you get an opportunity, how good of a job are you going to do at tackling that fight? Right? Because when it comes to preaching the gospel, it's a bit of like a spiritual wrestle. Now, if you've never wrestled in your life, then you're going to be very overwhelmed when you finally get into that tussle. I mean, I just started wrestling myself. And I just remember the first couple of lessons, like so overwhelming. Like just the strength and just the things that are happening. But as you learn and as you start to do it every week, you're learning the same moves, you get a little bit more comfortable in those situations. It's no different to preaching the gospel. 
You know, don't kid yourself that you're going to like never preach the gospel, never, never go soul winning, never talk about Jesus Christ, and then think, oh yeah, but when, when my friend asks me about it, I'm just going to be ready to talk about it. You're not going to be ready, right? You're not going to necessarily know the best way to explain it. There might be objections that you've never heard of, but if you're ready, if you've been doing it, then you're going to be ready when those occasions come your way, when those opportunities come. So not only that, preaching the gospel, but also like, you know, we have a children's ministry at church. You know, people can get involved in that, you know teaching the children, you know, helping them with the activities and you know, imparting some of the word of God to them. And not only that, but you, know, you can grow to the point where you can have a positive impact on another family in the church. Right? So all of us want to get to the point where you, know, you want to grow and not only just be a taker. Right? It's people that do things for you. When you're growing in the Christian life, ultimately what's charity is when you do things for other people even though they may not appreciate it. So, you want to grow in your Christian life where you, you know, know enough Bible, you're learning enough Bible. Hey, can I have an impact on another family? You know, maybe not now, but maybe in the future. You know, but if you're never growing, who are you going to help? How are you going to help others? So you want to grow to the point where you can have a positive impact on another family. One day, there may be young people, other families looking to you for guidance, looking to you for counselling. Hey, I can't just cover everyone. You know, what happens one day when our churches are 100 people, 150, 200 people? You know, we need other mature Christians in the church so that we can guide the next generation. And I'm not just talking about physically younger. I'm talking about spiritually younger. Right? So we want to get to that point. Now look at this in John 15. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And I sort of touched on this when I was talking about, um, when I was talking about the beginning, the growth. Often people have the mindset that, hey, once I'm ready, then I'll go out and bring forth fruit. But look at this. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, that's not talking about losing your salvation, but that's not what this sermon is about. It's talking about sometimes people get out of it. They fall away from the faith and get off. Every branch that beareth fruit, right? So the branch that's bearing fruit, look at this. He purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So you see how it's not purging yourself of the vain things and the sin in your life that makes you bring forth more fruit. What's happening here is it's already bringing forth fruit then it purges to bring forth more fruit. So again, the work comes before necessarily the cleaning up of your life. Right? But as you work, as you serve, then your life starts to clean up. Right? So you work to grow. You're not necessarily growing and then working. Now think about the physical life. The physical life, the more you work, what happens? The more hungry you get. Right? Like if you're the type of person that's very sedate in your life, right? sometimes you don't build up an appetite. But the more you work, if you're doing some physical labor or some very strenuous activity with your mind, what? You get hungry a lot more often, don't you? And it's the exact same in the spiritual life. You say, why am I not hungry for God's word? Well, maybe you're not doing enough work in order to you know, be hungry, to build up an appetite. Because that's what happens when you go out and you're preaching, you're teaching things. Not only does it teach yourself and reminds you about the love of God, but you know, oftentimes when you're trying to share God's truth with other people and you get stumbled and you don't really know how to explain, you're like, man, I better go and like learn that. Or I'm, like, I'm going to ask Victor about that question next time. I'm going to be ready. This is a natural progression in how you learn. But that's how you build up that desire. When you put what you know into practice and then you want to learn more, there's that constant cycle of you know, getting yourself in a situation where you're not really sure, then you go learn more, and ah, now you're ready. And then it's a constant growing. It's this constant, constant learning. So you want the ability not only to know the scriptures that support your position, but you want the ability to defend your positions as well. Right? So don't just grow to the point where you're like, yep, I have a Bible verse for what I believe. You want to grow to the point where you're like, I not only know the Bible verses that support what I believe, but I also know the Bible verses that people will use to try and object to these truths that I know in the Bible, and I know how to explain them. Right? That's the point you want to get to. Right? So when you stop working, you eat less, and you start to lose growth. Right? I'll just read James 1.22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. 
For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. You're looking at a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. This is why it's so important that you use what you learn. If you learn something, you talk about it. If you learn something, you use it. If you hear something in church and you say, hey, it's something I should be doing, you act on it. Because what happens if you don't, then you'll straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, this is the Bible, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So see, when you stop working, you actually start going, you actually start forgetting things. You know, and this is one of my last point in the Christian life. So we talked about food. That's how we're going to grow. But we don't want to just grow into an obese Christian, right? We want to grow strong. So we need to add some work to this growth. And the more we work, the more we're going to grow, the more we work, the more we have an appetite for God's word, and we're going to grow healthy. We're going to grow healthy and strong. And the last thing I want to talk about is time. You know, growing in the physical life, it takes time, doesn't it? Now, in physical life, growth is automatic. After so much time, you know, whether you, like, whether you want to grow or not, time is passing and you're growing. Right? It's one of those things that, you know, if you reflect it on a bit more, maybe you'll do some more things for God. You know, when you think about how, life, how short life is, and what really matters in this life, when you reflect on time, is ticking away, constantly ticking away. You know, sometimes it's good to think about that because then you think, man, what am I doing with my life? What have I done with my life? I better get to work. So time. In the physical life, growth is automatic. Now, spiritual growth takes time too. But whether it's automatic, it really depends how you think about it. Right? So... Why isn't growth in the spiritual life automatic? Because not everyone is living in the Spirit, is walking in the Spirit. Right? So you can say, okay, well, it's not automatic. Well, I, I'm trying to think of it this way, just to relate it to physical. Time spent in the physical life, you will naturally grow older. So then if you equate that to the spiritual life, time spent in the spiritual life, you will automatically grow. But the problem is people are not spending enough time in the spiritual life because they're spending too much time in the flesh. Right? So if you do not walk in the... If you walk in the Spirit, growth will be inevitable. Right? After time. But time spent in the Spirit, not time spent in the flesh. And this is why it's not automatic growth in the spiritual life because too many Christians, even though they're saved are spending too much time in the flesh and they're not growing spiritually. And the problem is you're actually going to be growing in sinfulness, growing in ungodliness. Look what it says here in 1 Corinthians 3. I wanted to show you this verse. 1 Corinthians 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. So notice there the difference between the spiritual life and the carnal life, the fleshly life. You think about carnal even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you are not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. You know there are some truths in the Christian life. It says here I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you are not able to bear it. There are some truths in the Christian life that babes in Christ can't always bear. It's not pleasant for them. Right? That's why sometimes you listen to my preaching and it's like, oh, I shouldn't say that. You know, maybe it's the way I say You know, I'm not perfect. You know, maybe I say things the wrong way. But I'm talking about what the Bible says. You know, how many times have people got upset about the Bible saying, you know, husband and wife, husband should be in charge, a woman should be following, women should be taking care of the home, having children. It's not because God's trying to oppress you, because that's what's valuable. What's valuable is children. I often tell people, you know, what's valuable is children. We raise children. Mom at home raising children. Why does dad go to work? Is dad going to work to make a name for himself and, you know, fulfill his dreams and do everything that women can't do? No. You're meant to be going out there and working to provide for your family. 
You provide for your family so you can provide them with the things that they need. That's the reason why we, we go out and work. You know, we're going out to work to like, you know, do all the things that the world tells you you want to do, chase a career and you, you know, build up a legacy in this world. It's the wrong mindset. It's the wrong goal. But notice how there are truths that if you're a babe in Christ, you may not take it. Right? But you have to understand, hey, you know, sometimes truths of the Bible are uncomfortable. Sometimes truths of the Bible are not pleasant. But, you know, everyone likes milk, you know, the sweet you know, milk of the word. It's nice. Yeah, you're going to grow, but you need to grow past that. You need to grow from a babe into an adult. You need that meat. Right? So increasing in godliness and decreasing in sinfulness. Right? This is how you're growing in the faith. Sin is time spent in the flesh. Now look at here in Galatians 5. So we have the back and forth between the spirit of the flesh. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So notice, it's one or the other. Right? When you walk in the spirit, you're not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. When you walk in the flesh... You're not walking in the Spirit. So it's this constant battle that's happening all the time. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are the contrary, the one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you would. So we're talking about time required in the Christian life for growth, but oftentimes people are not spending enough time in the Spirit. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now here are some examples of some works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh is a sin, are manifest, which are these. Adultery, right? Sleeping with somebody else's spouse. Fornication, this is sleeping with somebody you're not married to. Uncleanness, I just wanted to mention this one, because oftentimes we sort of relate these two together, you know, doing unclean things, unclean, you know, sexual things, uncleanness. But, you know, this also is referring to keeping yourself clean. You know, sometimes, you know, I've been soul winning, you know, you, sometimes you go to somebody's house and you're out soul winning and they open the door and it's just like, whoa. It's just like the smell just comes out of the house. And you know there's very little cleaning going on in the house. Very little showering going on in the house. You know, very little teeth brushing and flossing. Make sure you floss and brush your teeth, all right? Flossing is more important. You know, you don't want to lose your teeth. Floss. Don't just brush. You know, make sure you brush every tooth. You know, teach your kids. So, some high, general hygiene. Right, so it's the same in the Christian life. You know, uncleanness. I believe it's sinful. If somebody stinks and they're not looking after themselves, they're not showering, well-groomed, you know, this is not what God wants. God wants us to be a clean people, right? Lasciviousness. This is just like excess lust and, you know, hedonistic lifestyle. Idolatry, right? False gods. But the Bible says covetousness, which is idolatry. So don't think just because you're not bound down to some statue of a fat Chinese man that you're not committing idolatry, Idolatry is when you put anything above God, right? If you are chasing money more than God, that's idolatry, right? Witchcraft, right? It's like familiar spirits and getting into their Ouija boards and tarot cards and all that rubbish, right? That's witchcraft. Hatred, it's the self-explanatory hatred. Now, not all hate is wrong, I will say that. Not all hate is wrong, all right? There is a right time to hate things, right? Variance. Variance is like, you know, you're going back on your way. You have integrity and honesty and things like that. Emulation is you're a fake. Wrath. It's when you're angry without a cause. Not all anger is sin as well. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Strife. There's contention. Seditions. It's like planning evil things against people. Seditions. Heresies. False doctrine. Right? Uh, false, gospel, gospel, uh, false gospel particularly, right? False Jesus Christ. Envyings is not the same as jealousy. Envying is you want things that belong to other people. Jealousy is different. Oftentimes we think of jealousy as the same as envy. Jealousy is when you're, you are passionate about the things that do belong to you. Right? So if a husband gets upset, he doesn't want his wife being a floozy with other people, he doesn't like other men hitting on his wife, that's a righteous attitude. Right? It's a righteous, because that, that wife doesn't actually belong to you. Right? Envying is when you want somebody else's wife. Right? That's envying. Right? Murders, you know, that includes abortion, right? Killing children in the womb as well. Drunkenness, too much uh, alcohol. Revelings, revelings is like, you know, too much partying, right? Pleasure, people having parties all the time, banquetings. 
and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now don't mix that up. That's not talking about how to get saved, because obviously this is the flesh. The flesh does not inherit the kingdom of God. When I get saved, my spirit's born again. When I die, why do I go to heaven? Because my flesh is on the ground. I depart from the flesh. I go to be with God. And one day I'll be given a new flesh. So that's right. Those that have the flesh and are in sin, they will go to hell. But those of us who are saved, you know, we've been saved from the punishment and you know, we still have the flesh. That's why we struggle. But you know, obviously we're still going to sin while we're here. But we do, obviously our sinful flesh does not go to heaven. Verse 22, by the fruit of the Spirit. This is the opposite. Love. Notice how that one's first. Love, charity. It's doing good for others. Joy. You know, it's not just a happiness, a temporary happiness. It's eternal happiness. Peace. Long-suffering. What's long-suffering? It's when you put up with things, put up with wrongdoing against you. That's a fruit of the Spirit. It's how you know you're walking in the Spirit. Gentleness. Are you kind? Are you gentle? Are you soft with people? Goodness. Doing good things for others. Faith, believing God's word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 23, what's meekness? I always learn this, meekness is not weakness. Right? So meekness is related to humility. It's when you know your place under God. Right? Being meek, it's when you know. It's the same like at work. You know, at work you may submit to a manager. At church you may submit to the things I ask you to do at church. That's meek. Meekness is knowing your place in the authority structure. It's not weakness. It's not less value. It's like a wife submitting to a husband. It's not weakness. It's meekness because you know your place. It's, they say, power under control. Temperance, we talked about that already. Discipline. Against such, there is no law. What is that saying? You know, you can do as much as these as you want. Never be sinful to do these things that are in the Spirit. Now, what I want you to tell, say here in 2 Timothy 2, time in the Spirit, it requires consistency. It's going to require work. It's not going to be easy. So don't think it's going to be easy. Don't expect it to be easy. It only gets harder, right? Because as more, more and more the honeymoon period fades off, now charity begins, right? Where you love because you should love, right? Now, hopefully, if you have the right mindset, you will still have the emotions. Like a good marriage that works, you will still have a love towards one another. But it's a different type of relationship. It's the same in your spiritual life. As you grow, things will be harder. But that, through that hardness also develops a, a different kind of appreciation and relationship as well. 2 Timothy 2, Thou therefore, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You see, we're in a war. And because we're in a war, it's not always going to be easy. The Christian life is a war, right? Now, if you don't think there's a war going on, that's because we don't, babies don't normally go to war, <laughs> right? So that's why a lot of Christians, they're like, hey, Christian life is great. Well, it's because you're probably a babe in Christ. You're not getting enough involved in the work because when you get involved in the work, you'll realize the war that's going on there and it's not easy. It's not, it's not an easy thing to do. Now, the last thing I want to mention on this topic of time, where what you want to be aware of in the physical life, it only goes forward, doesn't it? In the physical life, what happens? You just only get older, you only get older, you never start going backwards. In the, in the physical life, you don't, I mean, don't you wish, right? If you didn't eat any food or, you know, you didn't do any work in the physical life, you just started getting younger, right? Just take a break for a couple of years and get younger. Well, you know what? In the, in the spiritual life, that's what happens. In the spiritual life, if you are not eating, if you are not working, you're not spending time in the Spirit, you know what happens? You start getting younger. You start going backwards, right? And that's what the Bible talks about, backsliding, right? You're backsliding back into your old ways. Why? Because you're spending more time in the flesh. The flesh is getting older. The Spirit starts to get younger. So, right? so this is what we've got to be aware of. In the physical life, hey, automatically you get older, you're always going forward, but not so in the spiritual life. 
in the spiritual life, if you do not take all diligence, like we talked about in the beginning, to grow in your spiritual life, you know what? You're going to start getting younger. Right? You're going to start getting younger. Let's look at Hebrews 5.12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. What is he saying here? He's saying, hey, you've been saved and you've been a Christian long enough that you should be in a position where you're teaching others, you're encouraging others, you're provoking others unto love and to good works, you're setting the example in front, but unfortunately you have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Unfortunately, you're back to being a baby that needs milk again and not strong meat. Look at this. For everyone that useth milk. So you see how it's likening the word of God, you know, to using it, right? You use the word of God. The more you eat it, the more you use it. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat, right? So these are the more intense and you know, you know, more meaty doctrines in the Bible. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even of those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See, the more you use it, the more you grow, you build that appetite, and it's the meat of the word. And you know, I used to think, you know, I used to think like, you know, the milk of the word is like, you know, God loves you, Jesus loves you, <laughs> you know, you save salvation. And then you think like the meat of the word is like the Old Testament and like end times prophecy and, you know, all the, you know, getting into the real nitty gritty of all these things. But, you know, I mean, think about what we talked about at the beginning, growing. Sometimes the meat of the word is like how to love other people, how to put these things into practice. Charity. I mean, if, if you go from milk to meat, why would the meat of the word only be knowledge? Yeah, there are some doctrines that are more difficult to understand. But don't you think the meat of the word would be charity? You know, the stuff that God, the way God wants us to live and behave and love others and do others. And now that comes into, obviously, learning knowledge to be able to pass on to other people. But I don't want you to only think that strong meat is only, you know, the more difficult passages in the Bible necessarily to understand. Sometimes they're the more difficult passages to do. Right? Difficult passages to do. So you can go backwards in the Christian life and there are people in church who have been in church for a long time and, you know, you think, oh, church just doesn't do it for me anymore. Well, it's because you're meant to be teaching now. You're meant to be thinking about how you're going to impart your knowledge and influence and example to other people, right? Like Hebrews 6 says, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance of dead works and of faith toward God and laying on of hands on of baptism. You want to get away from the primary. You say, I'll oh, come to church. I know it all. He's not doing it for me anymore because you know what's going to do it for you? What's going to do it for you is now you're going to teach others, right? When you teach others, that's when you start getting a different level of fulfillment in the Christian life. And that's where you ought to be. But too many Christians are still sucking on the teeth of the church and they're a teenager, right? So you don't want to be a teenager sucking on the teeth of the church. You want to be an adult, strong meat, growing charity, right? Growing spiritually. So are you growing spiritually? I hope you enjoyed today's sermon. A bit of a challenge today. Are you growing spiritually? Are you reading the Bible you know, you're doing some work for the Lord. Are you spending time in the Spirit? What area are you lacking in? You know, maybe you're working a lot, not eating enough. Eating a lot, not working enough. Spending time in the Spirit. You know, well, I guess if you spend time in the Spirit, you're going to be doing both of those. So, you know, today, you know, make a decision today to do something different. You know, too often people come to church, they leave the same person they came. But, you know, today, say, you know what? I'm lacking in this area. I'm going to do something different. Starting today. Don't do it tomorrow. Start today. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder. Man, all of us need to be growing, Lord, me included. Uh, Lord, thank you for, you know, your word constantly reminding us to grow in our faith. 
And Lord, help us to strive for charity. And Lord, the only way we're going to do that, we're going to eat spiritually, we're going to work spiritually. And Lord, help us spend more time in the Spirit, less time in the flesh. Lord, we need your help. It's not an easy road. It's not going to be easy. So help us, Lord, and give us the grace. Help us also to provoke each other unto love and good works. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.